So everyone, quite a bit of news today. First of all, on the Marvel side, Marvel has gone and decided to fire the writers and directors for Daredevil Born Again. And the Hollywood Reporter has opened this all up with new details of what went down there, some story details of what it was going for. And we also have some leaks out there regarding Foggy in the series and the lack of Karen Page. Also what this creative overhaul for the new Daredevil Born Again and what I'm seeing being called Daredevil Born Again again overhaul will mean for the series and honestly guys it is pretty nuts with the details that they get into with the mcu's approach to things because as the article unfolds there's just all of these details about the dysfunctional approach marvel has had with its series with complaints of a lack of central vision that has heavily heavily affected the studio shows with all kinds of creative differences and tensions so we're going to dig into all of that but also another really disappointing update to hear today is with regards to the SAG after strike the actor strike now you guys know I've been trying to keep you up to date with all of it all the way throughout the WGA strike that is now over and so naturally the studios the AMPTP have moved on to the actors and a lot of people were thinking that was going to be maybe swiftly solved you know because they were meeting and negotiating but yeah, they met yesterday, and let's just say it is not good. And I'm going to dive into what this could mean, what my thoughts are, and how this could end up affecting the industry still for quite a bit longer yet. But let's get into this article from The Hollywood Reporter. Headlined, Daredevil hits reset button as Marvel overhauls its TV business. And the latter of that is an understatement. And when you learn about the way they've been doing it, even though we've heard for quite a while about, you know, some things and some approaches, it really is... Yeah, you guys are going to be very interested in this one. So, right at the beginning, they say, It didn't take long to see the problem after Marvel Studios' Daredevil Born Again paused production in mid-June during the writer's strike. Fewer than half of the series' 18 episodes had been shot, but it was enough for Marvel executives, including Chief Kevin Feige, to review the footage and come away with a clear-eyed assessment. The show wasn't working. And... You know, one thing I want to say right off the bat before we get into even more of these details is that I am a big Daredevil fan. I've been such a Daredevil fan since I was a kid. Even growing up with the Ben Affleck movie, say what you will there, uh, I think some of the first comics I've ever read when I was a kid and got my first subscription that I went to a store to get was Daredevil. So I, I'm glad that with what we're about to go on to talk about, that they rather not put something out that they know is going to be potentially piss poor and they're going to try and uh, possibly rectify what wasn't working. And uh, let's let's get into what wasn't working. So in late September, Marvel quietly let go of head writers Chris Ord and Matt Corman and also released the directors for the remainder of the season as part of a significant creative reboot of the series. The studio is now on the hunt for new writers and directors for the project, which stars Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock, a blind lawyer turned superhero. So yes, uh, a complete overhaul there. Well, having said that, we're about to get into some things that they've maybe kept, but yeah, the directors, the writers, gone. Now up next is where they get into some details about what wasn't kind of working. I'm also going to mix in with some behind the scenes scooper tidbits here and there, which, you know, take as you will with a grain of salt, but it kind of paints a bigger picture into the bigger perspective of things. So the Hollywood reporters say that sources say that Corman and Ord crafted a legal procedural that did not resemble the Netflix version, known for its action and violence. Cox didn't even show up in costume until the fourth episode. Marvel, after greenlighting the concept, found itself needing to rethink the original intention of the show. Now that's really interesting. I think it being a legal procedural wouldn't have been a, a terrible thing so long as it kind of uh, also found this ebb and flow with the daredevil action. But what they're saying is that it kind of maybe, you know, was just very legal procedural given the synopsis that we're about to read out as well that was kind of leaked through the US Copyright Office, I believe. Matt Murdock kind of put Daredevil behind him, at least temporarily, and it would have been potentially four episodes of fans saying each week when this would have released, been like, where's Daredevil? Where's Daredevil? Why, why aren't we seeing Daredevil? And the more that Kevin Feige looked at this, I guess the more he was like, 
And then maybe even after we saw Daredevil in the fourth episode, how much would we have got him after that? Would it have just kept going into legal procedural mode again and again and again and again? This is when they say Marvel plans to keep some scenes and episodes, though other serialized elements will be injected, with Corman and Ord becoming executive producers on the two season series. So that makes sense. If you have already filmed some stuff, you might want to keep some of the stuff that worked. Now to offer some more insight on this, we have a scooper by the name of Can We Get Some Toast? And lots of people are backing this up, saying originally Daredevil Born Again had Matthew hang up the Daredevil cow for over a year after failing to save Foggy. So they killed Foggy. Kingpin would have been mayor, winning on a campaign of backing law enforcement while discouraging street-level heroes like Punisher, Daredevil, and Spider-Man. And he even says in some replies here to a fan wondering, so they had originally planned for Spider-Man to appear? And he was like, well, he was just mentioned in the speech that Kingpin gave as he was sworn in as mayor. Remember those set photos of Kingpin in New York on New Year's Eve? That was the speech. So if this is to be believed, and again, lots of scoopers are saying the same thing, there's lots of details coming kind of coming out about this now, which kind of also isn't surprising since uh, they kind of let a lot of people go and now the series is being completely overhauled. I imagine some of these things will be kept, but naturally a lot of fans are like, well, how dare you kill Foggy? But B, oh, since you're kind of starting from scratch, mostly from scratch, with Daredevil Born Again, again, maybe this time Feige and whoever's involved you might want to keep Foggy and maybe even bring back Karen Page. And I don't want to get anyone's hopes up for the overhaul here, but maybe they will make something more out of Foggy. Hopefully he doesn't die in the Daredevil Born Again again. Maybe they'll bring in Karen, but I don't know. I can imagine the overhaul happening and whoever still just doesn't want Foggy and Karen really involved in the series is just going to maybe maintain that. But... I could be wrong about that, but I'd love to know your thoughts on the rumors out there that seem honestly believable to me that they killed Foggy off and Karen was really just never involved. Now, we do have a synopsis for the series that came out a couple of days ago, but this is subject to change given the Hollywood Reporter story of the overhauling of the whole series. Marvel Studios presents Daredevil, in which longtime rivals Matt Murdock and Wilson Fisk try to leave behind their darker alter egos to serve the people of New York, only to have their pasts catch up with them. So that kind of, you know, runs in line with what we were reading out a second ago. They have left, or at least attempt to leave their darker alter egos behind them until they basically can't anymore, which is why I guess in episode four, uh, he would have suited up. Apparently there's some other somewhat leaked details out there of the original Daredevil Born Again storyline in where corrupt police officers start to use the Punisher's logo or rather misuse it. And as a result, Matt Murdock is basically itching to get back out there as Daredevil. Again, as to if any of that gets maintained in the new overhaul version of what would have been the legal procedural initially, or if they're keeping any, I mean, you would assume they're keeping some legal stuff given this is Matt Murdock we're dealing with. But yeah, this, this is all, that's kind of mainly the Daredevil bulk, but this is, you know, all a part of this larger dysfunction at Marvel and where we kind of get some more juicy details and how this will affect just in general, not only Daredevil in a way that we've just gone over, but every future Marvel series, such as how initially they, they didn't even have the approach of having showrunners and instead depended on film executives to run the series. And so the Hollywood Reporter go and say, as it moves forward, Marvel is making concrete changes in how it makes TV. It now has plans to hire showrunners and Gal's post-production work on She-Hulk helped Marvel see that it would be helpful for its shows to have a creative through line from start to finish. Obviously, that, that, that would be helpful, but the way they've gone about it has yielded in the approach to Secret Invasion, Daredevil Born Again, now being completely freaking rebooted in a way, and, and other things. So they, they go and say here, showrunners will write pilots and show Bibles. The days of Marvel shooting an entire series from She-Hulk to Secret Invasion, then looking at what's working and what's not, are done. And that does just really, I mean, it's kind of spelling the obvious, isn't it? It's like, okay, let, let's just chew all of this stuff, not really have a proper creative through line here of, you know, from start to finish of what we need to do and just after all of it, we could just fix it in post and see what works and what doesn't work. And then it kind of ends up with what I feel like a lot of people have been saying 
for the longest time and how, don't get me wrong, you know, people are still enjoying MCU things, but there has been this wavering kind of interest that I do feel is only a reflection of a product being mishandled. Like, audiences can notice that. Even though a lot of people do just consume entertainment, if you keep putting things out with a, you know, somewhat faulty development process that does impact things and even your most hardcore fans will notice the cracks in terms of how it's not being crafted the way it should be. The Hollywood reporters say here, and as Marvel does for its movies, it relied on post-production and reshoots to fix what wasn't working. Even though the company does not have a writer's first approach to TV, directors could feel shortchanged as well. The whole fix it in post attitude makes it feel like a director doesn't matter sometimes, says one person familiar with the process. And if you guys wanted the somewhat definitive example of this, well, we can look to see what they have to say about about Secret Invasion. So Carl Bradstreet, a writer and executive producer on USA Network Emmy winner Mr. Robot, had been working on the scripts for Secret Invasion for about a year when he was fired after Marvel decided on a different direction. Then enter Brian Tucker, and, and this is where they go on to say, but what happened next in the summer of 2022 debilitated the production as factions became entrenched and leaders vied for supremacy during Secret Invasion's pre-production in London. It was weeks of people not getting along and it erupted, says an insider. Marvel declined to directly comment on the matter. The company dispatched Jonathan Schwartz, a senior executive and member of Marvel's creative steering committee known as the Parliament, to get Secret Invasion back on track when it was falling behind schedule and on the verge of losing some actors because of other commitments. By early September, a good portion of the Invasion team had been replaced with new line producers, unit production managers, and assistant directors. And that's how, I guess, um, Secret Invasion ended up the way it did. And look, if you absolutely are obsessed with Secret Invasion, fair enough. But let's not pretend like everybody adored that series. And the latter of what they say in the article is super interesting because they go on to say, and just as Loki, which returned October 5th, marked Marvel's first season two of a series out of nine TV shows to date. The studio plans on leaning into the idea of multi-season serialized TV, stepping away from the limited series format that has defined it. Marvel wants to create shows that run several seasons where characters can take time to develop the relationships with the audience rather than it feeling as if they are there as a setup for a big crossover event. And I, I do agree with that. I, I think, you know, Daredevil Born Again, you know, it, it, we heard initially there was like 18 episodes, but now it's like a two season, nine episode per season show. Loki is now back with season two. I think instead of, yeah, obviously what they did in the past, I think people have not soured to it, but and I wouldn't quite say have become apathetic to it because people still clearly care. But if you look at the numbers of just Dis Disney Plus shows in general, even like the Star Wars ones, they have declined over time. Same with obviously the MCU ones. And audiences need to get invested. And this is what I think applies to everything, movies as well, in characters, emotion. And when, sure, it was cool, like, I, it was a much more exciting time, it feels like, back in the WandaVision days, when fans were, like, getting this as a fresh new thing, and it was a fresh new story, people still cared about the characters, but when it's just been what feels as though, as the Hollywood Reporter describe it here, you know, somewhat set up for a big crossover event, or more kind of bridging the gap to, like, a larger thing, when it's always just the bridge, it's not always so necessarily investment-heavy for the audience member, as opposed to, hey, like, Loki seems to be doing kind of quite well compared to other shows out there because people are actually caring, like, you know, say what you will about the writing, but they're caring about the characters. People love Loki and Tom Hiddleston's portrayal of that character through season one and two, the journey he's gone on with Mobius, the character relationships there between not only him and Mobius, but Sylvie, and yeah, it's just uh, a lot more people will gain that loyalty for multi-season TV that way. But as for everything on the Marvel front there, I want to know your 
thoughts on uh, <laughs> the very interesting information coming out from the way Marvel has handled its production, its approach to shows and development, Daredevil Born Again being freaking kind of overhauled here. I, I also want to leave it off on what Vincent Donofrio says, of course, the man, the myth, Wilson Fisk himself, by saying, every cool project I've been involved with has evolved constantly during pre-production, production and post. It's just reported on these days as if it's big news. It's not. It's simple. A bunch of creatives doing their best to get it right. It's a constant in this business. I wouldn't have it any other way. Frankly, I'd be worried if we were settling for less. I I kind of overall agree there. I mean, I wouldn't say like it's not big news because this is kind of big news. I think what he's saying with a larger meaning there is that the evolution and, you know, the, the, the things that happen between pre-production and post-production, there, there's quite often sometimes big things that aren't necessarily big news but are reported as such. But I would say this one is kind of big because this had already been started shooting. The only reason it stopped is because of the strikes and then they reviewed it and now it is completely like, let's just smack all the chess pieces off the chessboard and <laughs> start again. New writers, new directors. So this is kind of big, but I do agree with the bottom line sentiment that to make Daredevil Born Again the best it can be... Uh, for fans and you know to make a great show that doesn't damage the brand and the reputation I would also be worried if they were settling for less and just putting out something that they're like oh god let's just try and again the attitude they've had and what we're hearing from insiders let's just fix it in post as best as we can right that 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 is not the way to go and finally it looks like Marvel are starting to do something about that after you know, what happened with Secret Invasion and, you know, some other things. So again, let me know your thoughts there. But lastly, for today's video, I now need to turn to a quite a dreary update with the actor strike. I think everyone in this industry, from workers to below the line workers, obviously, to freaking everyone to the fandom, just want things to get back on track. Things were feeling really good with the WGA strike, as I said, with the fact that they met like on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and, and on a Sunday, they met the tentative agreement. They voted on it. They passed it. It's now officially over. All your favorite things are getting written again. And a lot of industry people, analysts, you name it, like anyone familiar, we're, we're, and me included, we're just kind of saying... Well, you know, now they're going to turn their heads to the Actors Strike, the, the Screen Actors Guild. And so they have been meeting. But when they've been meeting, something felt not like particularly off to me because this can be seen as normal. They met and then they wouldn't meet for a couple of days because they wanted to review things internally, like each side that is. So SAG would go away and internally review things, the AMPTP. So yeah, they were just like dotting their I's, crossing their T's to go back to the negotiating table. They did that a couple of times. And then when that kept happening, I was like, I can't put this down as like a really bad thing because they're just trying to work through it, right? But I still felt a little bit off. But unfortunately, last night we got an update which uh, really isn't good. And the fact that this is the response, and I'm about to read all of it out to you so we can react together, uh, is just, it is flabbergasting. It really is. I expect some kind of disagreements, but yeah, let's just, let's just get into it and then I can complain. <laughs> so sag after put this out. To our fellow sag after members, it is with profound disappointment that we report the industry CEOs have walked away from the bargaining table after refusing to counter our latest offer. Instantly, it's like, Okay, I'm going to try and contain myself because I'm just going to get pissed off. We have negotiated with them in good faith, despite the fact that last week, and get this, despite the fact that last week they presented an offer that was shockingly worth less than they proposed before the strike began. Oh, my God, like... The AMPTP, they sort the writers out. It's like, okay, let's get to our actors. Let's get everything back to normal, the industry back to normal. As I've even said, hopefully before Halloween, after all the admin post tentative deal stuff was out the way. But they go into it saying, hey, here's an offer that is worth less than the one we offered you before the strikes even began. What the f are they doing? Anyway. They continued to say, these companies refuse to protect performers from being replaced by AI. They refuse to increase your wages to keep up with inflation. And they refuse to share a tiny portion of the immense revenue. Your work, your 
work generates for them. We have made big, meaningful counters on our end, including completely transforming our revenue share proposal, which would cost the companies less than 57 cents per subscriber each year. They have rejected our proposals and refused to counter. Instead, they use bully tactics. Just tonight, they intentionally misrepresented to the press the cost of the above proposal, overstating it by 60%. They have done the same with AI, claiming to protect performer consent, but continuing to demand consent on the first day of employment for use of a performer's digital replica for an entire cinematic universe or any franchise project. That is nuts. They're claiming to protect performer consent, but then continue to demand consent on the first day of employment. So if you get employed, this is what they were trying to do. Like they're like, oh yeah, we give you, we give you like AI protection. But on the first day you're employed, like they're gonna be pressuring you to like basically, you know, give your consent for uh, a digital scan replica of you. And if if you like no, well then I guess good luck getting the job. Like what kind of new deal was this for them? Like do, do they think SAG is stupid? The companies are using the same failed strategy. They, and this this does seem familiar. The company the companies are using the same failed strategy. They try to inflict on the WGA, putting out misleading information in an attempt to fool our members into abandoning our solidarity and putting pressure on our negotiators. But just like the writers, our members are smarter than that and will not be fooled. We feel the pain these companies have inflicted on our members, our strike captains, the IATSE, Teamsters and basic craft union members and everyone in the industry. We have sacrificed too much to capitulate to their stonewalling and greed. We stand united and ready to negotiate today, tomorrow, and every day. I think you already know my thoughts on this. It is, it is, and the way they've laid it out there, it's just, it's for, quite frankly disgusting. And I don't, I feel stupid, to be honest, that I had the somewhat thought process that after the WGA, and to be honest, like loads of people had this thought process that we didn't think it was gonna be done in like five days or anything. But as I said, before Halloween, hopefully, or by Halloween, things should be more or less over. Or at least, you know, by Halloween, the deal would have been reached um, in terms of, um, you know, the voting, as I said, being done by the, the guild members. And then they pass it as the WGA did. But if they're walking away from the table after negotiating for like the past week or so, and this is the information we've got with what the AMPTP have led with, I'm just almost speechless at at how stupid the AMPTP are. Because I'm telling you, I mean, I, 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 I don't know every 180,000 individual person in the Screen Actors Guild, but they're not gonna stop because they shouldn't stop. They're gonna be like, just like the WGA, screw you if you're gonna try this bs that you did with the wga we're gonna keep we're gonna keep striking until you take us seriously so i think i think people just thought that maybe after how long it's been that they wouldn't let it go to like the length of what the wga did because you know they just want people to get back to work that's why they resolved the wga strike and so you would have thought, okay, don't get me wrong, they might butt heads a little bit because they need to iron out details for the actors, which, you know, even though a lot is similar to the WGA needs, there are still some things that the Screen Actors Guild want that's a little bit different to the WGA. So, you know, I was expecting, okay, you know, this could go a bit back and forth. But this update is probably one of the worst updates we could have had. And I'm not trying to like put fear out there or anything. I'm just saying this genuinely isn't great. Now, I don't want to be stupidly optimistic, but you never know. We could hear an update in the next week, a week and a half to two weeks that, oh, you know, they're meeting again. That would, that would be great progress because the reason why this is kind of scary is because when something like this happens and the A and PTP walk away or like they walk away from the, the negotiating table after kind of tensions raised to this point of a message being put out like this, that's where they haven't met before, like for the WGA and A and PTP when something like this happened for like a couple of months. Like they walk away for that long and both sides are like, screw you, screw you. And then eventually, because everyone is getting very fatigued by the situation and just want it out of the way, they meet again, where you kind of wish they would have done it in that two months. So what I'm trying to say is, is that going to happen again here? Are they going to spend like till, uh, I don't know, uh, November or so ignoring each other or like maybe trying to reach out, but one side's being more stubborn than the other? Or are they going to actually 
maybe not do what happens usually because it's been going on for a while already in the grand scheme of things and they actually might meet sooner than um we think even if they have walked away from the table the amptp that is i i'm gonna try and be optimistic sag here is saying that they're willing to meet today tomorrow any day it's the amptp the studio heads that are being like yeah we don't want to pay you we can't possibly part with less than two percent of our revenue it's just oh i, I i'm frustrated because and I don't need to justify it. Like, I think we all want to get this back to normal. And I want it to get back to normal for everyone. It's just, it's, I think for me, it's the principle of how stupid this is. Uh, and obviously that, what I mean by that is the AMPTP. Like, I get that, that, you know, negotiating happens and like each side, you know, might have to compromise. That's what happened with the WGA. And they came up with an exceptional deal. But are you really going to take the piss with how long you take to fold a little bit more with SAG. Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, one thing that will come out of this, just like before, is that the AMPTP, the studios, they didn't like the bad press they were getting. They were trying to manipulate that uh, as, as what we've already read here today, but it didn't work. They just kept getting a bad rap. Everyone kind of hates the studios as a result of how much they weren't paying the rise and how long they were bleeding this out. Same thing's going to happen here. So I guess what I'm dumbfounded by is, are they really going to repeat that again? Are they really are they really going to? I, I would like to think, even though they've walked away, so they kind of already have, let's just hope that it doesn't go on for like a, a month and a half break now before they go back to the tables. I'm hoping... Within the next couple of weeks, they might reach out again, maybe even sooner. But what if I'm wrong? I don't know. But that's where we're at. But for now, guys, you know, I am grateful that the WGA, that they can all start writing again. Projects can, you know, kind of develop that way. But without actors, nothing will be happening. Nothing can get promoted. Nothing, nothing really can get pushing along no deadpool 3 no the batman part 2 no penguin resuming is filming i don't know i'm at a loss for words now but uh let's just say it's not great and it's uh extremely frustrating and uh i amptp i don't know what the f you're doing like genuinely uh, no idea bro like so that is it for me today guys let me know your thoughts on that let me know your thoughts on what we talked about in the first part of this video uh if you want to stay up to date with all good things like this not always good actually let me know by leaving a like and consider subscribing to never miss out on one of these videos but until next time ladies and gentlemen really appreciate you watching hope you have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you guys in the next video goodbye